Hello. I'm Andrea Freeman, professor of law at the University of Hawaii, William S. Richardson School of Law. And I'm so grateful for the opportunity to deliver this lecture today over Zoom and look forward to answering your questions. As a Fulbright Scholar at King's College London, I'll be looking at how food oppression operates in the United Kingdom. This lecture focuses on the United States, but has global implications because of how the US has exported non-nutritious foods around the world to support its agricultural industries. So I'm going to start by showing you some slides of the latest incarnation of the alt-right obsession with milk. These are protesters at a New York anti-Trump art installation called He Will Not Divide Us. Neo-Nazis dance shirtless, chugging jugs of milk, saying that their action demonstrated their opposition to the vegan agenda. Milk also entered the Twitterverse, replacing Pepe the Frog as the emoji symbolizing white superiority in the Twitter names of newsworthy white supremacists. So this is Richard Spencer, president of the white nationalist think tank, National Policy Institute. And this is Tim Treadstone, an alt-right social media personality called Baked Alaska, with glasses of milk in their Twitter names. Here are some poetry and a map tracking lactose intolerance that was much discussed on the alt-right websites. For movie fans, there's a terrifying scene in the Best Picture nominated Get Out of a white supremacist slowly sipping on a glass of milk. Now this association between white supremacy and milk is not new. In fact, it's been around for about a hundred years. In the 1920s, a National Dairy Council pamphlet explained, the people who have used liberal amounts of milk and its products, meaning white people, are progressive in science and every activity of the human intellect. And in 1933, History of Agriculture of the State of New York declared, a casual look at the races of people shows that those using much milk are the strongest physically and mentally, the most enduring of the people of the world. The Aryans have been the heaviest drinkers of milk and the greatest users of butter and cheese a fact that may in part account for the quick and high development of this division of human beings. So a few years ago in my article, The Unbearable Whiteness of Milk, I explored how the United States Department of Agriculture or the USDA policy around milk also harms people of color. Despite overwhelming medical evidence that milk consumption is linked to serious illnesses and some not so serious conditions, like lactose intolerance, the USDA continues to encourage people to drink milk through the federal dietary guidelines and to dispose of surplus milk that the Farm Bill mandates it to purchase by giving it to communities of color, either directly or indirectly through nutrition programs where people of color are disproportionately represented. This includes the Supplemental Nutrition Program for Women and Children, or WIC, and school lunchrooms. They created a marketing branch from a dairy farmer checkoff program called Dairy Management Inc. that designed award-winning race target advertising and partnered with fast food companies to create products with more cheese. These products include a Domino's seven cheese pizza. Although white people eat the most fast food, it ends, it makes up a disproportionate amount of the diet of people living in poor urban communities of color. And this is an example of food oppression. So food oppression is facially neutral food related law policy or government practice that creates health disparities along race, gender, and class lines. Now, these disparities include high blood pressure, diabetes, cancer, heart disease, strokes, and obesity. And the food, agricultural, and pharmaceutical industries influence over government policy contributes to these disparities. In the United States, poor diet has overtaken smoking as the primary cause of avoidable deaths. 
cultural myths about personal responsibility that ignore structural determinants of food choice, as well as racial stereotypes, make these disparities appear natural. Another example of food oppression is the overwhelming presence of fast food in public schools. So in exchange for much needed resources, the fast food companies engage in intensive marketing to public school students. So teachers give out coupons for fast food as a reward for good grades. They distribute materials like fire safety guides with fast food coupons inside. Students and classes that raise the most money during their parent-teacher drives earn fast food prizes. Fast food is also on school buses. It's on school scoreboards, school signs, and games. And it's the site of school fundraisers. And this pervasive marketing contradicts the expectation that schools will look after the physical well-being of children. It also disproportionately affects students of color who attend public schools at higher rates than white students and participate more often in the USDA school lunch, breakfast, and milk program. They're disproportionately eligible for free lunches. And these students often live in neighborhoods called food swamps that are saturated by fast food outlets. Through its commodities program, the USDA uses its school meal programs to dispose of surpluses that result from the Farm Bill subsidies of certain products, including milk, meat, soy, and corn. And when they enter school meals, these commodities take the form of corn dogs, chicken nuggets, tater tots, sausage links, and pizza. And these processed foods contribute to high rates of obesity and type 2 diabetes which black children suffer from at greater white rates than white children. And the US government provides further support for unhealthy eating at school by calling pizza a vegetable. And even though young people of color have the highest rates of food related health problems, fast food companies have recently zeroed in on them for new marketing schemes. These young people are extremely attractive to fast food companies for a number of reasons. First, they tend to spend more money on fast food than their white peers. Second, they're considered trendsetters, definers of what is or will soon be considered cool. Third, they're particularly vulnerable to targeted marketing because they're in the unique position of developing their personal and racial identities at the same time and very open to outside influences. Youth of color also overwhelmingly have cell phones, even if their families cannot afford a computer or tablet at home. Fast food companies track the location of these cell phones and deliver coupons to customers when they're within a few blocks of their outlet. In many urban neighborhoods of color, young people are always within a few blocks of a fast food place, and of course, always on their phones. When they get into a McDonald's, they're encouraged to become brand ambassadors and do their own free advertising for the company by sending out snaps on Snapchat with the McDonald's logo and its messages in the frame. Kids can also engage in this type of free advertising while they're texting. And for even younger kids, there are racially targeted McDonald's games and apps. Well, if the USDA wanted to counter the fast food industry's marketing tactics, they could do so even without regulating. Eighth graders who perceive healthy eating as an act of social justice made better food choices. These students acted in defiance against corporations that market to vulnerable children and engineer junk food to make it addictive. Appealing to their values of autonomy and social consciousness was more effective than teaching them about long-term health consequences. But the USDA is unlikely to fund this kind of truth campaign because it would go directly against the agency's interests. Most of the fast food industry's contributions go to Republicans and the reign of our fast food president just ended. Racial stereotypes disguise the impact of government action on health disparities. The media often portrays Latinx and Blacks as overweight 
and lazy and weak-willed. And the myth of personal responsibility casts individuals as in complete control of their diet and health when in reality, food choices are constrained by external structural circumstances. Now I'm going to talk about two nutrition programs that contribute to racial health disparities. The Food Distribution Program for Indian Reservations and the National School Lunch Program. Much of the problem with these two USDA programs is their role as a vehicle to distribute subsidized commodities to assist the USDA in disposing of surpluses created by the Farm Bill. Now the first Farm Bill was enacted in the 1930s as part of the New Deal legislation responding to the Great Depression. It had the twin goals of supporting American agriculture and alleviating hunger. It accomplished these goals by subsidizing foods that were filling, leading to overproduction of certain foods like corn, wheat, and soy, while neglecting to support others, including fruits and vegetables. And although this strategy succeeded in reducing hunger, it contributed to the next food-related public health crises, obesity, and type 2 diabetes. Subsidized commodity foods dominate the programs designed to get food to low-income students and Indigenous people, the National School Lunch Program and the Food Distribution Program on Indian Reservations. So while the USDA would like us to think that school lunches look like this, they actually look like this. And the USDA promotes the FDPIR as this, but in fact, it's this. And the history of food assistance to tribes goes much further back than the New Deal. Colonization involved the deliberate destruction of traditional foodways. As part of the Indian Assimilation Project, President Washington vowed to ruin their crops on the ground and prevent them planting more. This policy led to mass starvation. Later, President Jackson ironically justified the 1830 Indian Removal Act that authorized the forced dislocation of tribes to the West by the fact that tribal lands could no longer support the indigenous way of life after the damage done by American theft and occupation. After the 1851 Indian Appropriations Act codified the creation of Indian reservations, the Office of Indian Affairs, which was housed under the War Department, took charge of distributing rations that the government distributed to prevent starvation resulting from the displacement of indigenous people from their homes, land, and food sources. The US wielded these rations as a weapon, withholding them from families who resisted their children's removal to boarding schools or rejected Christianity. The 1862 Dakota War, sparked by the deliberate withholding of rations, ended in President Lincoln ordering the execution of 38 Dakota men, the largest mass execution in US history. And sadly, the rations that the government did provide were made up of low quality and unfamiliar foods. The US deliberately left traditional foods out of assistance packages to try to steer tribes toward a civilized lifestyle. Then in 1949, the government began sending commodity surpluses to tribes and the FDPIR became an official program in 1977 as an alternative to food stamps because of the obstacles to accessing these stamps posed by tribes isolation. Today, indigenous people have more type two diabetes than any other racial or ethnic group. And this form of diabetes often leads to paralysis, amputation, and blindness. The rate of deaths from diabetes is 177% higher than for any other group. And indigenous adults are diagnosed with obesity 60% more often than white adults. On the Dakota reservation, life expectancy for males is between 40 and 50 years old, as opposed to 76 in the general population. Indigenous people have higher infection rates and two times the deaths from COVID than whites. And part of this is because of their higher rates of underlying high risk factors of obesity and diabetes. 
So commods, another name for the FDPIR boxes, contribute significantly to these disparities. Activist Charles Redgates recounted testimony that he gave to government representatives about the boxes in 1991. Did you ever see what's in these cans? This guy said, no, show us, we wanna see. So I grabbed a can of pork and I told him, you're gonna get a bad smell. It doesn't smell good and it doesn't look good when I open it, so you take a look. I got a can of chicken, a can of beef, and a can of pork. The first one I opened, everybody crowded around. I opened it up and as soon as I opened it up, a couple of them backed away and grabbed their noses and their mouths. When I began to dump it out, they both ran outside and threw up. That's what they were giving us. And I showed them all the connective tissue, the blood vessels. It was some pretty terrible stuff. Because the proteins and produce in the boxes are often undesirable or inedible, many recipients only eat the sugars and carbs. And the contents of the boxes are supposed to reflect the dietary guidelines created by the USDA and the Department of Health and Human Services. But Bernard and Brown describe these guidelines as, quote, amounting to, perhaps inadvertently, the nutritional equivalent of smallpox infected blankets. Their gross inadequacy likely reflects the guidelines allegiance to the food and agricultural industries. Karuk ceremonial leader, Leif Hillman, describes nutritional colonialism through FDPIR as, quote, a modern extension of tribal termination and genocide. The USDA defends the poor nutritional quality of these boxes by claiming that they're supplemental, but one third of program participants rely on them for all their food. Commods and their effects are so pervasive that for some people, they've become wrapped up in a pan-tribal Indian identity, bridging gaps between tribes because only Indians can have a commod bod. Commodity cheese is beloved across communities. A quiz titled, How to Tell if You're Rezzed Out, includes the question, every time you see a line, you jump in thinking that you're getting surplus cheese. Musician Wade Fernandez, a member of the Menominee tribe, sings Commodity Cheese Blues, and the song includes the lyrics, I went downtown to the commod shop, met the blues because they were out of stock. Tell me please when I'll get my commod cheese. Visa cheese is a mode of exchange in which a block of commodity cheese can purchase other goods or services. And a 2006 Indian Country Today article observed, some Lakota still say to this day that the only brick of gold the Lakota people got out of the Black Hills is the brick of cheese rationed out on commodity day. Aside from being highly processed, commodity cheese causes discomfort for many indigenous people who suffer from lactose intolerance and the other more serious health conditions linked to dairy consumption. Now the most controversial commod is fry bread, a delicious creation born of the need to convert flour, sugar, and oil into something palatable. To some, fry bread is a unifying symbol. These are pictures from the movie Smoke Signals of the main character Thomas trying to be a real Indian by wearing his fry bread power shirt. But fry bread has also become emblematic of bad health and a focal point of outsiders who attribute high rates of diabetes in indigenous communities to bad choices. Fry bread's famous fan, Keith Sakola, contends that fry bread has killed more Indians than the federal government. Susan Shawn Harjo, who launched a debate with her 2005 New Year's resolution to stop eating fry bread, said, if fry bread were a movie, it would be hardcore porn. No redeeming qualities, zero nutrition. Fry bread is not a traditional food, although it's sometimes treated as one, but it is a symbol of resistance to the disregard of indigenous health demonstrated by the sad contents of FDPIR boxes. The program contributes to nutrition transition, a shift from being underweight and experiencing high rates of communicable diseases to being overweight 
and suffering from nutrition-related diseases. But the structure of the program sometimes also leads to hunger. Elders who receive Social Security are not eligible for the boxes, even though their Social Security income is not enough to cover food. The boxes also create stigma, leading some people who are eligible for the program to choose not to participate. And some distribution centers have addressed this problem by switching from boxes to shelves, where participants can browse and select what they want. But it's still a problem in most places. So instead of trying to teach program participants how to make do with what they get, the USDA should expand the food that it offers. It should source the food from local tribes instead of limiting the products offered to ones with national distribution. And community members should run and guide the program. Now turning back to school lunches, as part of the New Deal, the federal government began buying surplus commodities and funding programs that hired cooks to make meals and serve them in schools across the country. So by 1942, the school meals programs were feeding 6 million students. But after the US joined World War II, surplus food was diverted to feed troops, reducing the number of school meals served. 40% of draft rejections during the war were because of poor nutrition, motivating Congress to officially create the National School Lunch Program in 1946 as a matter of national security. By 2009, obesity was responsible for a large percentage of military recruit rejections. Now, in addition to contributing to racial health disparities, the National School Lunch Program also contributes to food insecurity. There's stigma attached to free school meals. Some students whose families don't qualify or sign up for the program but can't afford to pay for lunch, must endure lunch shaming from cafeteria workers, who humiliate them by tossing out their full lunch trays, by writing on their bodies, making them perform chores in the cafeteria, or giving them a cold sandwich instead of a hot lunch. And many of these students would prefer to go hungry than to put up with this kind of abuse. In 2020, a Pennsylvania school district sent this letter home with students whose families owed $10 in lunch debt, threatening to have their children sent to a foster home. The district refused offers to pay off the students' debts. So there's a movement now calling for universal school lunch to eliminate this problem. The National School Lunch Program creates separate nutritional tracks for low-income students and students of color resulting in lifelong health disparities. For the last part of the lecture, I'm going to talk about first food oppression. So while researching milk, I started to think about breast milk, and I came across the story of Annie Mae Fultz. Annie Mae was a Black and Cherokee woman from Reedsville, North Carolina, who had lost the ability to hear and speak in childhood. She was married to Pete, who was a tenant farmer that was his nickname, 20 years older than her. They had six children already when she learned that she was pregnant with triplets. On her doctor's orders, she left the tobacco farm to stay in the hospital for a few weeks ahead of the birth. And when her daughters finally arrived at one in the morning on May 23rd, 1946, she was surprised by a fourth baby hiding behind her sisters. Annie May's perfect babies became instant celebrities reported on by papers all over the country. They were the first identical black quadruplets. Universal Studios even sent a film crew from Los Angeles to capture the event. Annie Mae's doctor, Fred Klenner, was white and an unapologetic racist. He was a vocal supporter of Hitler, who he called misunderstood. He also believed that he could cure anything from gum disease to polio with vitamin C. Dr. Klenner seized the opportunity that he saw in the girls' fame to try to prove these controversial theories by experimenting on the girls. He started injecting them with 50 milligrams of ascorbic acid on the day that they were born. Next, ignoring the names that Annie May had lovingly picked out for her daughters, he gave them all the first name Mary, then the names of his wife, sister, aunt, and great aunt. 
Anne Louise, Alice, and Catherine. Finally, Dr. Klenner started a bidding war among formula companies competing to become the girl's corporate godfather. St. Louis's pet milk company won the rights to use the sisters in their promotional materials. Through this contract, Fred Klenner managed to maintain control over the girls until they became adults. He had pet milk buy some barren land from his father-in-law for the family and install a window in their nursery where people could pay to look at the girls on the weekends, just like a human zoo. He kept the sisters isolated from other children, including their siblings. And he had pet milk hire nurses from his hospital so he could continue his experiments. Annie Mae could not travel with the girls, so their nurses went to Washington DC with them for a feature for Ebony Magazine. While there, although no politician would agree to meet with them, they ran into President Truman, who thought they were pretty and took this iconic picture with them. The girls experienced things that their parents could only dream of, staying in hotels, going on airplanes, appearing on television, and marching in parades. Pet milk sales went through the roof, but the famous sisters lived in poverty all their lives. And when they turned six and they were ready for school, Dr. Klenner convinced a judge to take them away from their family and make nurse Elma Saylor and her husband Charles their guardians. Elma convinced Pet Milk to extend the contract until the girls turned 18, when they met another president, that's JFK. And the girls were asked to leave college after struggling for two years. The sailors moved them up to Peekskill, where they tried unsuccessfully to break into the Manhattan nightclub scene. All four sisters were diagnosed with breast cancer at the age of 45. By age 55, Catherine was the only sister left, and she passed away in October 2018. Pet Milk's campaign featuring the girls was the first to target Black families to buy anything except for cigarettes, alcohol, and beauty products. In the first half of the 20th century, companies believed in a trickle-down theory of marketing, that Black consumers would want whatever white consumers wanted. Of course, they were wrong. And the adorable light-skinned Fultz sisters were the perfect models for a cross crossover campaign that opened the door to a new era of marketing, formula, and other products. Formula was necessary for many Black women because they could not afford the luxury of staying home to nurse their babies. Even when welfare, introduced in response to the Great Depression of the 30s, began to offer support for single mothers, it excluded most Black women. Later, when more Black and Brown women began to receive welfare, attitudes toward the program changed. It started to look more like a handout than a government responsibility. Then in 1996, temporary assistance for needy families made it possible for states to require new mothers to go to work as soon as their babies were born or lose their benefits. Several states forced mothers to give up the labor they did at home to do low wage and low skilled work outside the home. And in these types of jobs, breastfeeding is nearly impossible. Employers that see their workers as disposable and interchangeable don't provide paid breaks or safe spaces to pump milk. The US has no federal law requiring employers to give parental leave. And two thirds of women who bring suits against their employers for breastfeeding discrimination end up losing their jobs. The laws and policies that make it difficult for new mothers to breastfeed disproportionately harm black women who have the lowest rates of breastfeeding in the United States. Their rates are low even compared to Latina mothers who have a similar economic status. And people support laws and policies that create obstacles to breastfeeding largely because of widespread stereotypes about black mothers, like the welfare queen. In the popular imagination, the welfare queen is a single deviant black mother who has children just so that she can get benefits to spend on luxury cars and purses and fancy food. And this myth grew from stereotypes born during chattel slavery 
to justify the cruel separation of black mothers and children. The modern welfare queen combines elements of Mammy, Jezebel, and Sapphire. Mammy was the perfect caretaker of white children, but she neglected her own. This myth made stealing enslaved women's breast milk to give to white babies seem logical. Jezebel was a lustful black woman. She could never be raped because she always desired sex. And Sapphire was a sharp tongued ball buster without a maternal bone in her body. And the lie of the bad black mother continues today through popular culture and news media. And it explains why images of breastfeeding mothers are almost always white. And almost the only images of black mothers breastfeeding are in formula ads and National Geographic. Now the reality is that breastfeeding is hard for almost everyone. But doctors and nurses are not trained to give lactation advice. And they assume that black women just don't want to breastfeed, so they offer them formula instead of help. Hospitals in black neighborhoods have fewer black baby friendly practices, not black, baby friendly, <laughs> like rooming babies and moms together. Predominantly black cities are often first food deserts that lack resources for new mothers like La Leche League, which was designed by and for white mothers. People attack black women for breastfeeding in public and the government gives formula away for free to women who participate in WIC, but not organic or healthy formulas. And the USDA gets rebates from the formula companies that pay for most of the WIC program. And these aren't the only ways that the government and the medical profession support the formula industry. Pediatricians give out free formula in their offices and in exchange, they get perks like conference funding from the formula companies. The United States is the only country that refuses to sign on to an international agreement that prohibits formula marketing to pregnant people and to new parents and that would limit race targeted marketing. At the 2018 World Health Assembly, when Ecuador proposed a resolution promoting breastfeeding, the US threatened it with trade and aid sanctions until it withdrew it. Black parents and infants suffer from health problems and conditions linked to formula feeding, including infant mortality at much higher rates than other mothers and babies. And that is what I call first food oppression. And the false quads and first food oppression are the subject of my book, Skimmed. So I'll end there. Thank you again for the opportunity to share my work with you and look forward to hearing your thoughts and questions.